I uh, hope you had a great Thanksgiving watching those uh, photos on that introductory slide. If you ever have a chance to join us early and see all those good pictures, please do. Uh, one of the questions that I get asked most often for anyone that uh, who's not a Mason that has seen the Festive Board uh, Masonic Table documentary we did, they always ask, um, is that really alcohol in those shot glasses that you're drinking? I said, no, we're, we're not that tough. We're, we're drinking grape juice um, because there's quite a few toasts. And I don't think if we were drinking alcohol, we would be standing upright. Um, anyway, let's jump right into business. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Thanks for joining us. Um, Brothers, on behalf of the Rubicon Masonic Society, as usual, we're excited to be with you for another evening of virtual Masonic education, where we gather outside of our lodges to learn a little bit more about Freemasonry, uh, learn a little bit more about ourselves, learn a little bit more about each other, and how to better utilize the tools of our craft within our everyday lives. This episode marks our 54th episode of virtual Masonic education since we started in 2020. This series is entitled 21st Century Conversations on Freemasonry. For those of you who are returning visitors, uh, returning to our education rather, we thank you and appreciate your continued support. For those of you who are visiting with us for the first time, welcome you, hope you enjoy the education and discussion tonight. And for anyone that may be watching this video or listening to this video outside of our live uh, recording session, uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss a monthly episode of our education. And anyone that does wish to join us live can do so at rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash RSVP. Just a little bit of protocol before we jump right into the education. As always, special thanks to the William O'Ware Lodge of Research, Lexington Lodge number one, and of course, all of the members at the Rubicon Masonic Society. Special shout out to Worshipful Brother John Bizak, who is our vice chair, Worshipful Brother Dan Kemble, who is our recorder, Worshipful Brother Alan Martin, who is our chaplain, who are all on the education with us tonight. So thank you all. And on that note, Worshipful Brother Chaplain, Alan Martin, will you please do the honor, sir, of delivering an opening devotion? Absolutely. Brothers, let's pray. Grand Architect of the Universe, as we gather this evening to continue our exploration of Freemasonry, we ask for your blessing, guidance, and divine wisdom to guide our conversations. Bless us with intelligence and intercalation so we may be productive in our undertakings. Amen. So mote it be. So mote it be. Thank you, brother. Uh, brothers and friends, our virtual Masonic education aims to help us to become better men, always devoted to our family, our faith, and of course, our country. So may we all come together tonight to learn, to discipline our minds and subdue our passions and improve ourselves through the tools of Freemasonry. Quick disclaimer that any opinions expressed or discussed tonight will be those of the presenter. They do not represent any lodge or Grand Lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. If you have any questions, please visit rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash disclaimer. As you all know, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are more than welcome and encouraged to participate. So please be mindful, brothers, that anything discussed this evening should be suitable for Masons of all degrees as well as non-Masons. Uh, gentlemanly manners are to be expected at all times. We ask no alcohol, no smoking, no eating, no foul language, no discussion of politics or religion at any time. Uh, we appreciate you respecting our protocol. In an effort to best ensure that this meeting is as enjoyable as possible, we do ask that attire for each meeting is coat and tie for joining us live with video. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title under your location so we know who you are. If you're not a Mason, please simply type guest. Please enable your video camera if you would like us to see you, which of course we want to see you. Please reduce background noise, keep your microphone muted, turn off all other computer programs and all the other good things that come with it. Uh, and of course, please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Brothers, we have a special treat for you tonight. Uh, Worship Brother Daniel Rivera uh, and our very own Worship Brother Bizak, will you please do the honors of introducing our special guest tonight? I will. Thank you, brother. First of all, Brother Daniel Rivera is Master of Southern California Research Lodge, and he's recently been installed for his second term. He's Past Master of Elysian Lodge 418 and Senior Warden of Rosetta Lodge 666, both in Los Angeles, California. He's an active member of numerous appendant and invitational Masonic bodies serving as past celebrant of California Lodge Societas Rosiana, 
You'll have to help me with this, Daniel, later. Rosia Sienna, is that the way? Uh, he's participated in New York Rite and Allied Masonic degrees, and it's, it's a life member of Guthrie Valley Scottish Rite in Oklahoma, as well as a member of the Royal Order of Scotland. He's a frequent contributor to the Southern California Lodge of or Lodge's Fraternal Review magazine, where he also serves as part of the editorial team. Brother Rivera, it's good to have you with us tonight, and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you for having me, brethren. I'll just proceed to get the PowerPoint going. You can share your screen anytime, brother. Okay, everybody can see that well? Yes. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you for having me, brethren. Uh, this will be a, a relatively brief but a timely introduction to the role of Masonic Research Lodges. And once again, thank you for having me. And we will begin with a question, what is a Lodge of Research? Now, the role of a, the Masonic Research Lodge is that of presentation and discussion about the challenges which face lodges both in uh, the 20th as well as in the 20th century. A research lodge is a duly chartered and consecrated lodge of Freemasons, specifically authorized to meet by the respective Grand Lodge in the jurisdiction in which they meet, and works by applying the principles of scholarship and historical investigation into Freemasonry via the presentation of papers holding discussions, gathering and disseminating Masonic information, pursuing original research, and often the publication of the lodges, transactions, or other periodicals. Some lodges of research will also maintain libraries and or supply speakers and presenters at the request, at the request of local blue lodges or other Masonic bodies. Research lodges may meet quarterly or biannually, but rarely weekly, as do many lodges in American jurisdictions. Now, while a lodge of research will have the same line of officers as a blue lodge, the ritual work at a physical meeting is limited to that of opening and closing a tiled meeting, as well as an installation ceremony. Research lodges do not confer degrees, well, that is taking good men from apprentice through fellow craft to master mason and typically restrict membership to master masons in good standing grand lodges often have a different per capita for research lodge members and different requirements for dual membership research lodges can be found in many states and countries with some jurisdictions having more than one research lodge as of this presentation my own jurisdiction, that of the Grand Lodge of California, has four chartered Masonic lodges of research with two under dispensation in 2023. Currently, the lodges that are chartered in California are uh, my own, which is the Southern California Research Lodge meeting in Los Angeles, Golden Compasses Research Lodge in Folsom, El Camino Research Lodge, which meets in Menlo Park, that's in Northern California, and also Northern California Research Lodge, which meets in San Francisco. What is the proper role of a lodge of research? The aim of a research lodge is no less than further light in masonry. A lodge of research endeavors to spread Masonic light to all brethren, whithersoever dispersed, by means of the exploration and documentation of research into Freemasonry, its history, symbolism, philosophy, and those principles which have application in our own lives, in our culture, and in our communities. Masons hold in great value those three principal tenets, brotherly love, relief, and truth. Our respective symbolic lodges aim to make these available by making good men into Masons, by spreading friendship and brotherhood, as well as by extending a hand of relief to a distressed worthy, and doing charitable activities in our local communities. 
Yet, some Blue Lodges may struggle with the third tenet, truth. While they may be effective in passing on memory work and transmitting a satisfactory delivery of ritual, they may find themselves challenged to unveil the meanings of our Masonic symbols and lore, or may not be as knowledgeable about our shared history and philosophy. These lodges may be saddled by a deficiency in time to a portion towards Masonic education, or by not being aware of potential resources, whether regionally or online, or perhaps a local lodge membership and culture may find a peculiar lack of interest in Masonic education. Perhaps there is a deficiency in ability among local brethren to discover and disseminate Masonic information. Many of us may have once found ourselves in situations where we were one of the very few members of a Blue Lodge with interest in pursuing Masonic education. Lodges of research were created to address these strongly felt needs to be a resource to brethren both near and far, from the youngest entered apprentice to seasoned past masters, by encouraging new areas of study on topics which may not have seen sufficient attention, as well as exploring those aspects of the craft often encountered, but not as frequently understood by our brethren. Published papers may be made available for brethren to share with their respective blue lodges, and in some jurisdictions, experienced speakers and presenters from lodges of research may be available to visit and share a presentation at the invitation of a symbolic lodge. While research lodges are not centered on the performance of ritual, we at Southern California Research Lodge value ritual excellence. And as a result, most of our officers have prior ritual experience and aim to perform in keeping with observant practices, performing all ritual with due solemnity and reverence. How do lodges of ritual, how do lodges of research relate to other lodges or Masonic bodies? Research lodges do not confer degrees, and any non-Masons interested in Masonic membership are referred to a nearby Blue Lodge or Grand Jurisdiction for further information. Lodges of research are often conflated or confused with Masonic research societies. While it is true that both lodges of research, such as uh, my Southern California Research Lodge or William Ware Lodge of Research, and research societies such as the Scottish Rite Research Society or the Masonic Society or Philolethes, as organizations, all similar aspects, that is, a dedication to research on Masonic themes with a goal of producing a publication. Research lodges are yet fundamentally different in that the meetings of a lodge of research are opened and closed in accordance with the specifications of the Grand Lodge from which they are chartered and similarly require a vote of the Lodge to allow a Master Mason in good standing to become a full member, with voting rights and the ability to hold office. Research societies generally extend membership and or subscriber status upon receipt of payment with no other requisites for membership, and are generally unaffiliated with any Grand Lodge. Many research lodges may also have correspondence circles, or a correspondent level of membership, or a subscription status that is open to non-members or even to non-Masons, to allow for some level of participation in the activities of the research lodge, and to benefit from the law and materials. In short, a research lodge may have a corresponding Masonic Research Society, but a research society may not necessarily be connected to a research lodge or grand lodge. Are research lodges for, quote-unquote, Masonic scholars only? Although many prominent Masonic scholars, authors, educators, researchers, and speakers have been and are members of research lodges, anyone who has an interest in Freemasonry, its symbols, history, philosophy, and its applications, will find value in becoming a member. Research lodges exist to help a 
assist members in their own research efforts by becoming a clearinghouse of ideas, introducing new avenues of study, as well as by providing guidance in any research projects, presentations, or similar avenues of interest. When and where did lodges of research begin? The first lodge of research was Quater Coronati number 2076, which was established in London in 1884 and consecrated in 1886 under the United Grand Lodge of England and which continues to exist today. Named after the four crowned martyrs, the traditional patron saints of stonemasons, Quater Coronati was initially founded to address many of the imaginative and highly speculative writings of earlier Masonic authors who had opined on the beginnings and history of Freemasonry without conducting evidence-based research to support their argument. This began what is now referred to as the authentic school of Masonic research. Meeting five times a year, generally at Freemasons Hall, they published their annual transactions in Ars Quater Coronatorum, as well as arranging conferences and symposia on many different aspects of Freemasonry. Full membership is often extended to serious and well-established researchers. Quater Coronati also shares its research and scholarship via the Quater Coronati Correspondence Circle, QCCC, which is the world's first and oldest research society, which was established more than 135 years ago. QCCC enjoys worldwide membership and is open to everyone. How is a Lodge of Research funded? The Southern California Research Lodge is entirely funded by membership dues and sales of the Fraternal Review, our annuals, and other merchandise on our web website and at booths set up in Masonic events. Many lodges of research will likewise fund their operations by means of dues and sales of their transactions or other publications, or by holding special events such as conferences, symposia, festive boards, and table lodges. Can any Mason join a lodge of research? Each research lodge has their own requirements for admission as a member. Many restrict membership to master masons in good standing from a jurisdiction and amity with the Grand Lodge under which the research lodge is operating. While many lodges of research may extend membership to any brother around the globe, the Southern California Research Lodge limits full membership, which is the ability to make, second, or vote on any measure, uh, as well as to hold office to master masons in good standing of the Grand Lodge of California. That being said, all masons in good standing, belonging to a jurisdiction in amity with the Grand Lodge of California, are welcome to attend and participate in our meetings and join in our traditional observance practices, our dinners, our meditations, paper presentations, our chain of union, as well as special events, such as 2023's inaugural Table Lodge, and 2024's Masonic Con, which will be held in partnership with our sister lodge, South Pasadena Masonic Lodge number 290. Subscription to the Fraternal Review is open to anyone with an interest in Freemasonry and features contributions from brother masons from multiple jurisdictions. We reach a worldwide readership and audience via our printed materials, website, podcast, and social media platforms. Is membership in a lodge of research a good fit for you? Membership in a lodge of research affords Masons camaraderie with like-minded men who come together with a shared goal of receiving as well as disseminating Masonic light and the warmth of true fellowship, intellectual stimulation, rich discussions, friendship, and fellowship are but some of the many benefits of membership. What opportunities and challenges exist for lodges of research in the 21st century? 
As is the case with the larger corpus of American Freemasonry, membership and participation in research lodges has seen reductions from the historical numbers of the 1950s. Yet, where others may see in this a decline, I propose that we approach this trend as a challenge and an opportunity. More dedicated brethren will find an opportunity to uphold and participate in the traditions of their respective research lodge. And rather than solely looking backwards at a fraternity's historical accomplishments with nostalgia, we can demonstrate in our own ways how the craft remains relevant by restoring observant practices where possible and aiming for excellence in how we conduct our meetings and our Masonic labors. As one of several facets of our Masonic experience, membership and participation in a research lodge can help us become better leaders, better members of our communities, better educators. Rather than reacting to greater trends, we can take up the challenge to shape them. To this end, the Southern California Research Lodge draws inspiration from our fraternity's past excellence by means of the aforementioned observant practices in our labors. Our quarterly meetings provide fellowship with other dedicated brothers from near and far. Our officers come throughout from throughout the vast distances of California, some traveling 130 miles each way for our quarterly meetings. Our membership also includes brothers who willingly travel as much as 400 miles from Northern California to Los Angeles in order to participate in our proceedings. We have enjoyed high caliber presentations from esteemed Masonic scholars, such as our chief editor, Brother Angel Millar and Brother Timothy Hogan at our inaugural table lodge. And our monthly publication, The Fraternal Review, takes pride in exploring themes which may not be addressed in other publications, such as exploring parallels between popular culture and the subcultures when, as they relate to the workings of our craft, the rich symbols and their place in the wider Western spiritual traditions, the different ways in which our brothers have helped our country and our society. Feel free to visit our website for more information on our activities and publications. And should any brother Master Mason in good standing find himself in Southern California around the time of any of our meetings, feel free to reach out and make arrangements to attend one of our meetings. Now I wish to thank the Rubicon Masonic Society for the invitation to be present with you this evening and to all of you for your kind consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Worship Brother. Appreciate that very much. I will take the screen back if you don't mind. By all means. Okay. okay. All right, everybody Perfect. should see my screen. So um, I'll, I'll kick things off. First, um, thank you. Good presentation, good overview outline of the Research Lodge. Um, I know we have a lot of a lot of brothers on here that are members of research lodges would be very curious to know uh, who some of those brothers are. If you want to just comment maybe in the chat box that you are a member of a research lodge, uh, be, be good to see some of those hands raised. Um, I wish you had a few more pictures of your lodge of research in Southern California. I had the privilege of, of going down there a couple of years ago, and I believe you and I did meet, right? That was when, was Dago... Was he the master at that time? That would have been a couple of years. Uh, my Dog was my predecessor, so that would have been about uh, maybe last year or two years ago. Okay. Yeah, I don't recall. You guys have a beautiful location uh, so mm -hmm. there. Excellent dining hall facilities. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. So um, I guess my initial thought to kick this off is let's go back to the very beginning, if you don't mind, and let's talk about Quator Coronati as the first lodge, why, in your opinion, did was this lodge started? Was education not being um, utilized in Masonic lodges that brought the need on for research lodges? Uh, asking very basic and open-ended questions, but I'm curious to know your thought on, on the evolution of Masonic research lodges from the beginning. Absolutely. 
And for those of us that have a made study of our of the history of our fraternity, uh, many of us are aware that there are multiple writings in the first century and a half from the since the formation of the Grand Lodge, uh, the Premier Grand Lodge in London, 1717. Uh, everything, uh, everything, and everyone from William Preston through uh, Albert Mackey, Albert Pike, many of which writings are inspirational to this day, but nonetheless may not be as grounded in uh, documentary evidence uh, as, had, as has since become available in subsequent centuries and sub subsequent decades. And there was definitely a need to uh, ground uh, Masonic education on what is factual to, to differentiate from what that, that which is legend, that which is part of our tradition, a part of our lore. And that need was finally met via Quattro Coronati, which did a lot of much needed research uh, based upon th those manuscripts, which had then had become available and were subsequently made available by brethren who are who are and were members of Quattro Coronati. So I believe that uh, that really took off uh, over the past uh, century and a half since uh, the formation of Quattro Coronati with subsequent research lodges, subsequent bodies, which have uh, provided beautiful information. And we're seeing that a lot of this research is still coming uh, coming along via brothers such as uh, Arturo de Hoyos, Joseph Wages, uh, who are discovering other documents, making them available to the wider Masonic community. community. So yeah, I believe that Quater Coronati was uh, a key moment in our Masonic history. I'd like to pick the brains of of Force Brother Dan and and um, is Tom Nitschke on here? I don't think he's with us tonight. Maybe a few others because uh, Force Brother Kimball, you were past master of the William O'Ware Lodge of Research. Definitely want to get your input in this in the, in these discussions. Um, what what is your take on the evolution and inception of research lodges, Dan? Um. I can only speak for what I have observed in Kentucky. Uh, you know, five years ago, Kentucky had uh, two research lodges, and now we have six. So um, I, I think there is, um, I, I think what that illustrates is that there is um, some demand for uh, Masonic education that goes beyond uh, the simple mechanics of uh, uh, the rules and regulations of Freemasonry. Uh, and, and I uh, bro worship Brother Rivera. I enjoyed your presentation uh, very much. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned um, was um, your working partnership with uh, with a working Blue Lodge. Uh, and, and I uh, we, we have uh, entered into a similar relationship at, uh, at William O. Ware. We uh, we partner quite frequently with Lexington Lodge One and uh, and the Rubicon Masonic Society, and that's been very profitable for us. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you partnership with uh, with your Blue Lodge in South Pasadena. Absolutely, so the, uh, South Pasadena Masonic Lodge is uh, as as you as many brethren have mentioned. Brother Evans has mentioned it's a very beautiful temple, and the the brethren, uh, many of the brethren of South Pasadena Masonic Lodge, are also uh, dual members with Southern California Research Lodge. So there's a lot of overlap in uh, in objectives in in the in the labors that we do, uh, particularly with the emphasis on Masonic education. Uh, South Pasadena has their own uh, program called the Illumination Lecture Series, and they have brought in brethren from uh, from other jurisdictions, uh, many eminent scholars from across the country. And at the Research Lodge, uh, we help support uh, that work as much as we can. And we will be doing the same with them next year uh, with the Masonic Convention, which is being spearheaded by them. Likewise, uh, in our own events, we we fly in brothers uh, from other jurisdictions, such as Brother Angel Millar, Brother Timothy Hogan, to present at our at our special events. Uh, we've done uh, different types of work in, uh, in conjunction with uh, with uh, Masonic societies and research lodges elsewhere. And we uh, look forward to continuing to do so. Uh, piggybacking off of that question and comment, what about the communication across jurisdictions? I mean, how is that? Um, how have you seen that come about? 
that uh, that work, I believe, has been uh, very profitable. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, our contributors include brothers from all jurisdictions. Our chief editor, the chief editor of the Fraternal Review magazine, is Brother Angel Millar, who belongs to the Grand Lodge of New York, and we arrange our uh, we do all our practicalities uh, via Zoom, and we're able to traverse these vast distances uh, thanks to the internet. And likewise, we reach out to uh, interested brethren in other jurisdictions, in other uh, in other Masonic bodies who who share that same vision of spreading Masonic light to, uh, to interested uh, brethren. Uh, one of the things that I'm very much looking forward to next year is a partnership with the Philaxis Society. Uh, and we're working on an issue on Prince Hall, which is going to be coming out at some point in 2024. That is one of several partnerships of which we have carried out. We've also done a similar partnership with uh, with the Rubicon Masonic Society in the past. Uh, we've done similar partnerships with the Masonic Legacy Society. One of the things that uh, that we find is a great strength in our fraternity is to extend that chain of union far beyond just that just our individual jurisdictions, but to all brethren who share that same passion for Masonic education, for Masonic light. Great. Thank you. Uh, brothers, if you have any questions or comments, please, you can put your questions or comments in the chat box or raise your virtual hand. Victor, go ahead. Go ahead, Victor. Uh, my name is Tom Lamb. I'm from the Seattle, Washington area, uh, originally from Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, much of my research was based on early Freemasonry, but in the last uh, couple of years, I have tended to separate research from education. And I like to separate lodges into lodges of research and lodges of education, because the, the basic functioning is a bit different. While research has to be shared for the light, there is a difference. And now I find myself sharing knowledge that other people have presented as a means of education. I also find that uh, in the 17 years I've been a member of Walter F. Meyer, the interest in research has diminished significantly. And uh, the best we have education. So uh, I'm a member of uh, Correspondence uh, Coronati in, in London. And um, the Scottish Rite Research it's interesting to see that the latest transactions had about uh, three uh, presentations from fellow Scotsmen, which is encouraging, some of whom I know. We have had visitors to the lodge and usually have good attendance when we have visitors like uh, Illustrious Davis, Illustrious, um, oh goodness me, my mind at the moment, and then of course Bob Cooper from the Grand Lodge of uh, Scotland. But I'm a bit uh, worried, disappointed, and uh, not to be critical or anything. Uh, I find I'm also I'm at, get the transactions from Southern California, and I get a lot of my material for education from there. But I have to say that. I find that the transactions share knowledge that is or, or existing and less original research. I may be unjust in saying that, but I wanted to share it with the opportunity of our author, to, uh, presenter today, who is, of course, past master and uh, member of it. But um, this is my first opportunity, being a different time frame. Um, to Rubicon, I've tried in the past to keep it in my diary and uh, thoroughly enjoyed tonight's, today's presentation and hearing from others and look forward to joining in more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, brother, very much for your comments. You know, that's an interesting perspective, research 
versus education have being being quite different. Daniel, what do you think about that? How how would you comment on that? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, research can be an individual endeavor, while education uh, is a collective endeavor. It's one where we come together and share what we have discovered with our brethren, and it's part of that. It's part of that. Uh, of, as, of that aspect of the principal tenets that share as a as a part of our brotherly love we share that light which we have received with others uh, we impart that uh, truth which we have which has inspired us to others uh that uh it is an act of relief an act of charity to uh provide an insight to a brother that has that might have been looking for one and couldn't find one before so in that regard i believe that uh, masonic education is a very central part of the work that we do as masons and it's uh, something that i think that research and education do go hand in hand of course but the act of educating and sharing that light is one of the greatest things that we can do as brother masons and i would i would add to that that i think research going down the research path leads to discovery of education and discovery of education leads needing to go further down the path of research so it's it's an interchanging uh, circle of life, I guess, from my initial perspective, is how I would see it. They 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 need each other. They're dependent on each other. Um, Victor, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I want to offer a conversation. We're not able to hear. You. Your microphone is not coming through well. We're hearing every other word. Uh, okay. Nope, not very good. Not very good audio. All right, if you can get your audio fixed, we'll try again. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, I think you may have a question for our presenter. Go ahead. Uh, I do, and, and follow up to Brother Lamb's uh, comments as well. Um, we have experienced that there are brothers who come to research lodges either as visitors or join because they're not receiving education in their own lodge um daniel um what, what what's your take on that what, what about research lodges that do no research they just meet what what's your take on all that that is a very good point uh brother bizak it's one of the one of the dangers i suppose or one of the risks is that uh uh, some research lodges or some bo Masonic bodies in general may uh, decide to uh, uh, lose focus on the work that they're called upon to do, which is whether it's Masonic education or research, and may decide to just uh, become a, a supper club. That's definitely a, a major risk. Uh, we find that in our blue lodges as well as in in different in different situations. That being said. Uh, when uh, when everything is uh, done according to uh, that focus, which a research lodge should have, a, a research lodge will be able to fill that need that a brother a brother may not find in their local blue lodge. Um, many of us may have had the experience at some point of being in a uh, in a uh, in our home lodges or in another location in another Masonic body uh, with many questions about what uh, different things might signify or a little bit of a history or some of the lore, and uh, we don't find satisfactory answers from the brethren in that body. And that is where a research lodge can uh, become that clearinghouse of information for uh, for these brethren. And when all is, uh, in, uh, when all is uh, said and done, a research lodge is, uh, is a beautiful lighthouse in a rocky shore, which uh, which is the the situation that we might find ourselves in in American Freemasonry in this day and age? Yeah, thank you. We, we am aware, um, thanks to Dan Kimball, who came up with an idea some years ago that there should be a a papers night, and the papers night uh, usually four papers presented one evening, about fifteen minutes per presenter. Um, it's not so much that each of them is a a uh, unique piece of research as much as it is an opportunity for some members who have never presented anything or bothered to take a look at a topic that interests them and put something together that may interest other people, not necessarily uh, any empirical research, as it were. Um, but it's been very successful 
And I think it um, contributes to giving those men who want to do more than their Blue Lodge is offering them or won't let them do an outlet, which I think is another purpose of a research lodge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I totally agree with that. And I think that any uh, any lodge can uh, apportion a minimum of 10 to 15 minutes for the purposes of Masonic education, even on a very busy uh, meeting night uh, where there might be yeah. business to transact. Uh, uh, a, a lodge should, uh, uh, t in, uh, uh, in best uh, circumstances, uh, try to make some time to, at the very least, share some ideas and share some some concepts, especially uh, those uh, research lodges which may exist in various jurisdictions yeah. uh, and, as much as possible. Sure. Thank you very much, brothers. Absolutely. Brothers, there is absolutely nothing that I would rather do than take credit for papers night. But the real credit for that uh, goes to worshipful brother Bill Lorenz, who revived the practice of Papers Night uh, that, that used to occur in the uh, in the middle and late 1980s, and uh, and it has in fact become uh, one of our most popular meetings of the year. And there are brothers uh, on this presentation tonight who have uh, who have offered up papers, and uh, if any of them want to weigh in on the value of Papers Night, I'd, I'd be happy to hear that. Can uh, I add a comment to my earlier? One please. of the things I found, at least in experience in my lodges, is the reluctance uh, of getting speakers to present printed papers. They will give talks, but they won't want to put anything on in writing. And of course, when the transactions, uh, we are now uh, digital, but when we used to publish transactions, you needed a paper, a written paper. And I just find it, like, as they say, drawing teeth from uh, the, the just a uh, guy. What about others? Do you find the reluctance, a willing to present something, but reluctance to print it? That's a good question, brother. And I think that uh, when it comes to um, a certain reticence to print uh, uh, a paper, uh, if the, if a brother there, something that can be done, and that's something something that uh, we offer at my own research lodges to uh, provide guidance to a brother if they feel that they lack confidence in their writing ability or their ability to um, to present their remarks uh, in print. Many brothers will will deliver a very beautiful. Uh, presentation in, uh, in person, but they might feel that they might need, uh, that their work needs to be a little bit more edited before it sees print. And that's something that uh, that uh, in our lodge, we we offer that opportunity to have that at work edited and made of it and subsequently made available um, either at our website or sent out via direct email to our membership. Um, and there are many guides online to do that. Uh, the Massage Society, for instance, has um, uh, participates in the Quarry Project, which provides very, very good guidelines for any brother who might be interested in in uh, publishing their work or how to properly edit uh, their um, uh, their remarks uh, before before printing. So that's a very good question, brother. All right, we have a lot of questions and comments coming in, so we'll, please just everyone try to keep it slightly brief. Uh, Victor, let's try number two. Thanks again, brother and brethren. Um, I want to I want to um, pick it back some, but really, hopefully, really quickly, uh, benefits. I think that's the original. The question uh, is, is what are the benefits of the research lodge? And uh, there, uh, I find um, that there's, the, uh, according to uh, Pennsylvania, um, there's the a member's pocket jewel. There's a lapel pin. There are the transactions of the lodge. There's the um, the share of of knowledge, um, which, to in my opinion and to my understanding, gives a little bit, at least, of some um, of essence of or the 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 craft lodge or, um, as it pertains or the ritual pertains to it. Um, and that's because in, in the essence of the research lodge is all of of the third degrees. Um, resources are no fit, and uh, the exchange of ideas, that's one of those promising kind of benefits. 
um, and exposure to new ideas. And so that's a real plus. Um, it goes into my piggyback on what I heard mentioned earlier about shared history and philosophy. And the reason why is because um, the first one is, is uh, the Quarter Coronati, um, Lodge number 2076. Uh, and then so the, uh, of that, here is the understanding of the empire, if you will, of, of research lodges. And um, it's not, uh, it's not all, as, as it's, it's more that I am aware of are members of the correspondence circle. And very, very, very much more. And the reason why is because my understanding of the correspondence circle, it consists of members and non-members, which is really um, skillful. OK, um, so therefore, a research lodge to me can become a, a research platform in a metaphoric way. And that's because it's not like a craft lodge where you've got the three degrees. Rather, you have them consolidated. And so you're looking on a linear scale of what you've seen before. And that scale is going to offer you what you wanted before and was no way possible for you to get it until you had to, uh, you know, purse a period of time. Rather, here you walk into it. So there's a history that's a benefit. There's development that's a benefit. And all of this is in, in terms of the entire fraternity. It's also a database. And it's a I need, Victor, I need, Victor, I need to mute you and interrupt you for a second. I am terribly sorry to just cut you off. There is so much discussion behind you. It's so difficult to... Um, uh, to keep up with what you're saying. So if I could just ask you politely, if to, if you want to repeat your comment, we can do that. But we need you to try to be in a quieter place, if you don't mind, sir. I appreciate it. So we're going to we're going to move along because it's just very difficult to to he hear with the background noise. Uh, David, go ahead. Thank you very much, brother. Um, I am currently the uh, master of the Ohio Lodge of Research. And in the last five years, we've been largely been in a in what I would refer to as rebuilding years. There was a time when uh, we only had a couple of members so, showing up to meetings. And so one of the things we've been challenging, three points, I guess, but one of the things that we've been kind of challenged with trying to figure out is actually the question that's come up a few times here is that difference between research and education. And, you know, definitely wanting to be a research lodge, but there seems to be a need for education more than research at this time. Um, with that in mind, then, what we have been discovering over the last year or two is that we have a lot of brothers in Ohio that are very interested in doing research, Masonic research, but quite frankly, they have no idea how to do it. So kind of informally, our mission has become teaching people how to do research. So it's an education, but it's necessary to get us to a point where we, I think we will have a, a greater volume of good quality independent research. And, uh, and so I think that's a very important thing to, to consider is that there are many people out there who want to be a part of the research lodges. And I think they want to provide new research ideas, but quite frankly, they have no idea how to do it. And I think that's another obligation that we have. And the third point that I wanted to make is, again, tying into that research versus education thing, is that we I think we need to remember that research is not something that is done in isolation, that research for the sake of research really doesn't get us anywhere. Once you have come up with this great new idea and you've done the research to support it, then the communication side comes. And so from that standpoint, even if you are doing new, unique, independent research, a greater component of your time, I think, needs to go into the education and the communication and the sharing of that with other brothers, one, to share your ideas, but two, to get them excited about doing their research as well. So I don't know that I, I apologize for not having a question, but those are my comments. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David. Great comments. Daniel, any any response to that? Yeah, I believe uh, brother, uh, worshipful brother David uh, makes many good points. Uh, research uh, is uh, obvious. It's not uh, solely uh, something in an ivory tower to be um, uh, a rarefied uh, uh, endeavor. It's something that is uh, that should be followed through with an application in our in our circumstances. In our case, which is to then spread that light to other brothers. 
uh, just to quote from the volume of sacred light, uh, volume of sacred law, where uh, a, the, a lamp is not hidden under a bushel, but it is set on high for it to shine to others. And uh, in, in similar fashion, uh, that uh, those avenues of research, which uh, a brother may be uh, able to carry out, should subsequently be be made available to others. And all the, all what one of the work one of several things that a research lodge can do is provide guidance about how to go about that work, uh, different way different ways that they could go about it, or different places where that uh, where material can be sought out, uh, how to properly uh, frame uh, ideas, and then how to be able to, and then be able to share uh, what uh, different insights that we may have gained uh, for the for for the benefit of the brethren for for uh, the benefit of discussion. So these are just some of some thoughts that come to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Bruce, good to see you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I think I saw somebody put in the chat is that research is definitely done with uh, facts versus hearsay or just one's own thoughts and comments. And uh, I recently went down to Southern to Todd County in Kentucky and uh, we were visiting the homestead or the memorial, I guess, for Jefferson Davis. And I wanted to know, and uh, I think it was Worshipful Brother Chad Simpson, who I believe is deceased now, if I remember right, um, had written an article for the Northern Masonic's jurisdiction about that exact uh, question, whether he was, uh, Jefferson David was a Mason or not. And he quoted uh, the New York Times newspaper as saying, no, he was not a Mason. And he, in fact, said there were some other papers that were going around at the time uh, saying that he was, and he said, no, he was not a Mason. So yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, if some of my brothers down in Kentucky have not been down to Pembroke, Kentucky, there is a very nice uh, facility there. And I learned a lot about brother, or uh, about Jefferson David Davis as uh, not only the president of the Confederate States, but also as a Senate member of the Senate or House, I forget which he served. Uh, Bruce, you muted yourself. How much of that did you hear? <laughs> I don't think we missed much, maybe the last 10 okay. seconds. Guys, this is our 54th time. There, we should be having zero audio problems tonight. <laughs> we know we know what we're doing. Um, I want to offer a quick spin uh, on the research lodge. You know, maybe I think that one of the questions was papers night and, and, and discovery of Masonic research. But I think a lot of another part or perspective to think about is, is self-discovery. Because, it you know, for a lot of men, it's difficult to write a paper, let alone present a paper. Maybe it shouldn't be, you know, that's your perspective, but to for someone to get up in front of Lodge and deliver their paper, you know, they're they're researching and discovering a bit about themselves, perhaps that they never had before. So and that's one of the great things about masonry is it brings out uh, parts of you that maybe you've never, never delved into before. So just wanted to add that perspective. David Crickard. My brother, my friend, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh... Worshipful Brother Rivera, thank you very much for your time and presenting this paper. Uh, I, I, I'm first probably going to make a comment and then get to my question. You know, something you said in there, it says uh, the per one of the reason purposes for a research lodge is to receive and pass on Masonic light. So uh, it made me think, started me thinking about what we've talked about a lot uh, in meetings over the past few, uh, quite a, uh, we've discussed education quite a bit and how a lot of lodges don't participate in education. And uh, uh, Brother Kimball said, Kentucky has six lodges of research. <clears throat> so I'm wondering if uh, the 
the light that is being produced in our research lodges is getting out and still in my comments. So, you know, we have a, uh, a, a, a publication that comes out every month, the Masonic Home Journal. Why would a research lodge not advertise in a something like this that goes out to a lot of blue lodges to offer up services to uh, come to their lodges and provide ed periods of education. And, it, you know, so I guess my question is, is uh, uh, what are your thoughts about a research lodge uh, should actively work to provide education services to blue lodges that may not have an educational program? So I volunteered uh, the research lodges, which I'm not a part of, to do something. And then I'm asking you a question about it. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Brother David. And uh, in best circumstances, a research lodge can uh, train uh, brethren, experienced brethren, knowledgeable brethren, to uh, make themselves available to local, local uh, blue lodges and provide presentations. Uh, speaking uh, for on behalf of uh, Southern California Research Lodge, we have many uh, uh, many former masters, many uh, active members who live in the Southern California uh, area who make themselves available to speak at uh, different blue lodges upon request. And uh, likewise, uh, some of our some of our, our brothers have mm -hmm. presented uh, in this forum as well as in other uh, Masonic platforms in. In prior years, including uh, uh, Brother Cheryl Smith, who I believe is in in this uh, in this uh, Zoom meeting, as well as Brother Dago Rodriguez, who has also participated in various uh, events. So, uh, in best circumstances, uh, a research brother. How, how do you, brother? How do you get that out to like? How can like what I'm saying is like actively market? How do you, do you all do that? Do you like put out the word, not just the word, but like in a publication or something where that the Grand Lodge produces, which make means these Blue Lodges really, they don't have to read it, but they should be seeing it. Is that making sense is my question? Of course. Yeah. And that, of course, uh, that depends on uh, the what what is available in one's jurisdiction. Here in California, we make a, a we have a list made available to our grand jurisdiction tool. And our Grand Lodge of California has a list of available Masonic speakers, which is accessible to all our, our membership up and down the state. So if a, if a lodge uh, decides that they want to do a Masonic education night, they can go on the on our Grand Lodge uh, list and they'll see many of our research lodge members and they can call upon us to to show up. That's, that's what we do in our jurisdiction. But uh, in other jurisdictions, perhaps it might meet, uh, be something along the lines of word of mouth or, or potentially setting up a website and or, or going on uh, social media platforms and uh, just uh, uh, spreading the word of uh, the different keep, different services offered by the research lodges for the purposes of Masonic education. Good question. Thank you, brother. Absolutely, Chad. I'm glad. I'm glad you have your hand up. I wanted to address your two questions earlier in the chat. So, so. Oh, I've had I've had a couple more since then, but you know, <clears throat> um, my. <clears throat> We've kind of circled back to it. Um, I was lucky, um, and I'll bring up the Midwest Conference on Masonic Education again, just because um, we had a lot of fun doing it. We involved our the Ohio Lodge of Research, and I thought it was one of the things that we wanted to do with them was essentially lower that barrier to entry, that fear of, you know, everyone in the Lodge of Research, they're the smartest people in the world. I have nothing to offer, nothing to, you know, I, I can't be at the table with those people. We had kind of a resource room at the conference. People could just kind of bring up half worked papers or thoughts or ideas or just talk to people about some half formed idea. And um, just to kind of piggyback on something that you said, brother, about kind of going to where the brethren are. I mean, the brethren out there are thirsty, but how do they know about us? And whether it is mailings or road shows or pop-up type things. Sometimes as a lodge of research, I wonder how much we really should be getting out there more actively as opposed to kind of keeping it insular. Um, so I guess my question is, do you think that 
lodges of research that there is, that there are barriers to entry that we need to lower or that we should keep them where they are? That's a very good question, brother. And I would say that uh, that uh, barriers to entry are basically just what is uh, made available by a by a particular jurisdiction in which our research lodge operates. Uh, speaking uh, from uh, my experience here in Ground Lodge of California, the only requisites for our uh, research lodge is that uh, somebody be a master mason in good standing and uh, specifically belonging to our jurisdiction, the Grand Lodge of California. Uh, now, other research lodges might uh, extend uh, the barrier, to, uh, a barrier of entry to any brother master mason in good standing in, in any part of the world. Uh, uh, an example that comes to mind is uh, Quattro Coronati may uh, in, uh, may induct members uh, who are coming from the from the United States or other parts of the world uh, who frequently who frequently travel to the United Kingdom and are well established and seasoned uh, scholars and researchers. Um, so it, it all depends on one's jurisdiction. So uh, as far as that uh, intimidation factor that uh, that has been mentioned, as far as uh, feeling uh, somehow uh, uh, outclassed or somehow uh, not uh, not up to par to other men in the room. I would say that uh, that one way to go, to overcome such notions is just understanding that we're all on the level. That uh, whether we're uh, the the brand new uh, brand new master mason or a seasoned past master, we're all meeting on the level. We're all united by brotherly love, and uh, there's no uh, there's no need for uh, for us to uh, to uh, uh, try to impress one another, but rather extend a helping hand. Uh, make sure that the brothers who uh, are coming with questions uh, have uh, have their have their needs met, and just uh, express uh, uh, make sure that our actions are are uh, are full of humility and full of uh, full of love and, and compassion for our for our members. And I think all of that will make the work that we do not only a lot more pleasant, but also a lot more masonic. Thank you. Brother Richard? Thank you. That's a great answer. Thank you. Brother Richard Kovac, go ahead. Yes, uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to the uh, Rubicon Masonic Society uh, uh, broadcasts for the last couple of years. I usually don't speak up, but uh, here with the lives of research, I am currently the worshipful master for the uh, Walter F. Meyer Lodge of Research in Seattle, Washington. We are currently engaged in a digitization project to digitize all of our past transaction papers. What is the status of digitization of papers throughout the country? Uh, the reason I bring that up is I would like access to papers that are being produced in all of the different research lodges simply because I think we are duplicating ourselves in many respects because we don't know what's going on. For example, in my line of work, I'm a historian. I do research on uh, Mesoamerican culture and uh, archaeology and anthropology and whatnot. We have a, a clearinghouse for uh, articles that are produced all over the country, in fact, all over the world, that I can access and help with my research in formulating a new paper on my part or uh, using it to uh, illuminate uh, some of the organizations that I deal with that want this kind of uh, education and research presented before them. Is there a central clearinghouse in the United States, uh, never mind Quattro Coronati, but in the United States in which we can participate and look up the papers that are being produced by all of these great lodges of research throughout our country so that we can learn what's there, what's not there, and maybe build upon it to go further. You know, the old standby of standing on the, on the shoulders of giants to reach further up to the sky for more Masonic enlightenment. Just wondered if you could comment on that. Thank you. Absolutely, brother. And that's a very good point. Uh, that uh, there's a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, beautiful research that's being conducted by brethren and all around the world. And uh, over the years, I have seen a couple of websites set up which try to provide uh, links to different Masonic education resources. 
Some have become obsolete. Uh, they may not have been updated for, for years, but they will present links to all the various uh, research lodges, all the various mas uh, Masonic societies or grand, grand jurisdictions or Masonic libraries. Uh, these, this is the closest that I've seen in terms of a centralized uh, clearinghouse to present this info. Uh, speaking from my from my own jurisdiction, uh, at uh, our website, which is uh, www.theresearchlodge.org, uh, we have links to other Masonic bodies. Our website makes uh, uh, makes a free article available available every month from our Fraternal Review magazine as well as uh, our, our link to our podcast, which is also available for free. So it's uh, so th that work of uh, centralizing and making uh, of uh, making all digital uh, Masonic information much more readily accessible. I think that's a uh, that's something that uh, I think would be a, a great thing to work towards in the future, uh, provided that uh, there's I think that as long as that there's collaboration and cooperation and and open uh, sharing among brethren, I think that is feasible in the future. Thank you, brother. I think okay. another res uh, another resource might be to contact the Masonic Service Association of North America mm -hmm. in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, because they put out uh, things for all the LEOs, as far as I am familiar with, because I... Uh, one of my lodge brothers passed that on to me recently. So that's definitely a place that you might want to ask them. Uh, excuse me, I'll, I'll just intervene. Yes, I, I, I'm familiar with MSA. I, I receive their pamphlets all the time. Uh, very nice articles. I'm looking for in-depth research that uh, respected scholars in our research lodges have produced. Not that MSA doesn't have that. It's just that I think there's a lot more out there than what I'm getting monthly from the MSA. Thank you, brother, though. Uh, brother Richard Kovac, we hereby nominate you and appoint you to the position of chair for the committee of putting together a digital clearinghouse for the for the world of Freemasonry. And you have our, <laughs> you have our full support. <laughs> and, I, you know, I say that in jest because you're right. It would be great. And there should be something where we can collectively come together to to share our knowledge and information, but there isn't. Um, I would be surprised if one is ever created, but mm. it certainly would be a wonderful tool. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Brother, uh, thank you, Ray. All right, Victor, we'll try this one more time. Uh, keep it keep it brief, please, if you don't mind, sir. Thanks. Okay. The, um, uh, the, the QC 2076, the first research lodge, um, so all the research lodges have come from QC 2076 and what QC 2076 has separate, right? Um, more or less is a correspondence circle and it has members rather than masons and non-members, uh, allowed. Uh, and so we have this network uh, for access to resources, which are, fellow brothers uh, in since the circumstance here is this fraternity. Um, now, besides what I already said earlier, uh, the resources and exchanging ideals, it's a platform that's got a linear perspective about what we really have on the inside. I think that's where our journey in research should be going um, because, the, because our question is, is right now on how to get there. And I think we are already prepared for it, but we've the challenge to contend with. And that's pretty sublime to give up, to give for, to, to trade even, to, 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 to bargain or gamble with what we really are capable of doing. So we've got a circle, it's a research lodge, which is all research lodges. And because of, um, because of that, uh, we've got the ability to learn in research lodges. If we apply this type of thing, and I understand, if we really, if we each just do what, if we can get through the challenge, then we're able to see what research lodge really has packed in. We've access to company acquisitions. We've access to elementary foundations of masonry. 
We've access to correspondence with a main lodge still, and we've access to a green light on what the plan is because it's all in the third degree, right? And we've all had the thirst from the blue lodge. So Victor, so, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Do you have a question for Daniel? Well, it, yeah, but it, my question would, would wrap up in how, which is developmental, not why, but how we can, in research lodges, uh, begin to turn our attention away from Blue Lodges, Grand Lodges, and operate with that education in the research lodge, doors closed, so to speak because that's what it's gonna take. We're in reality in Research Lodge. It's not a dream between one lodge and the other lodge. The Research Lodge is stand alone, significantly not doing degree work, not doing ritual work. We have a platform there for um, the third degree, which I believe are unable to understand. So the, a developmental question and a sociological imagination is how we began uh, to, um, to put use our database and kind of turn loose, you know, wean from where we are right now. Well, when it comes to uh, the work that uh, research lodges do, uh, by our very nature, we are uh, we operate under the charter of a, of our grand jurisdiction. So uh, our work is not uh, independent. Uh, that being said, we are given leeway to explore, to research, but we are not a, a body that operates. Uh, 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 opposite or parallel to our grand jurisdictions. Uh, Masonic, uh, Masonic societies, on the other hand, are not affiliated with any grand jurisdiction. Uh, that being said, they uh, a Masonic society will still aim to operate within the the landmarks of Freemasonry. So that, I think, is just something that is important to point out. Um, now, a research lodge can uh, make its information available uh, and different uh, in different fashions via social media, websites, different platforms. And I think that uh, both the Rubicon Masonic Society, the Southern California Research Lodge, we have done we have done um, our utmost to share that information. And I this is uh, those are my general thoughts as far as what you were asking. And uh, feel free to uh, to follow up in any way. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, brothers. All right, we have time for maybe one or two more questions, if there are any left out there. Jerry, I'm going to call on you, Brother Jerry, and only because I want to get another perspective. So you recently petitioned, and I think we'll be balloting on you this Wednesday for your membership in the William Aware Lodge of Research, or was that already complete, Jerry? That, that was already completed, so I, I'm a member of William Aware. So why did you uh, want to join William Aware? Well, I like the idea of, um, you know, Research Lodge sort of, uh, you know, uh, I guess, guarding the landmarks, um, setting the standard um, for Freemasonry. But I, I do have a question that was sort of touched on with the digitization comment um, for Brother Rivera. And, and also thank you for your presentation tonight. Great presentation. Um, is there any type of publication um, from the research lodges uh, nationwide that they um, can contribute to um, you know, on a national level or a joint publication, not, not a periodical, um, but, uh, you know, book gets published or something like that. That's a good question. That, uh, the Southern California Research Lodge, we, uh, our main work is the publication of the Fraternal Review, which is which includes contributions from uh, brethren throughout the country and is available to a worldwide readership. Uh, that's one one of several uh, periodicals which is available uh, not only to receive uh, the work of uh, of brethren uh, anywhere in the world, but is also made available to anyone who who wishes to learn more. Likewise, uh, our website has um, our website has free articles. Uh, the opportunity to submit uh, articles of different sorts as well, uh, based on a, a submission schedule, which is made available uh, to any any visitors to our website. Uh, so again, um, w one of the things that uh, we try to make, ava uh, make available is that the work, even though we are based in Southern California, we are not uh, limited 
to uh, to the reach of this state or this jurisdiction. We uh, we uh, are at the uh, service of our brethren anywhere, whether so ever dispersed around the globe. Great. Well, where's Brother Daniel Rivera? Thank you, sir, for joining us um, on this presentation, this education tonight. I think it's obviously a very interesting topic, a topic that could go down many avenues. Um, one we didn't even talk about is how do you even begin research? Uh, and, you know, and how do you research? Just some of the basic questions that are probably more difficult to answer on some level. But thank you, sir, for joining us tonight. Is there any other comments you'd like to share with us before we move on? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to uh, thank uh, Brother Dan Campbell for uh, reaching out uh, and uh, also to you, Brother Brian, uh, for and uh, Brother John Bizak for the work which uh, you have uh, all shared with uh, with the Southern California Research Lodge. And uh, I look forward to remaining at uh, your service and at your disposal as, uh, as may be called upon. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you. And I have to poke fun just a little bit at Brother Jerriel. So is he pulling his weight over there, you know, with the fraternal review? Is he doing a good job still as editor? <laughs> That's a thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, poking fun at Brother Jerriel. Yes, he's uh, he's definitely uh, making uh, making his presence felt here. <laughs> he better. Jerriel, we'll give and, you the last word. And it was, it was actually at uh, the Masonic Con in 2022 in July. <clears throat> that uh, you grace our lodge with your presence uh, uh, and we'll be doing I think another one this coming July right. uh, but um, we don't we don't really get very even original papers that we write are are not what you'd really call um, uh, re deep research like like Quattro Coronati um, does we we often do uh, things. Uh, we we print parts of things that that they they present. But um, our our approach usually is um, mining other uh, publications and um, uh, condensing what they write and giving. Uh, uh, a footnote at the bottom as to where you can go to read the whole thing. So we're we're encouraging uh, people that way, and also in our local area, we have a, um, a calendar of uh, events that are doing being done each month by uh, by lodges in our jurisdiction or that are available. Uh, we, uh, as you know, Brother Brian, uh, we. We publish who's speaking at this uh, at this event. I think this is one of the best um, sonic education lecture series uh, that I've been able to find in the country. And uh, so we try to find places for people to to um, look. Uh, but uh, you know, you 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 can only lead the horse to water. That's a exactly. uh, good point. That's and that's exactly right. If anybody has a chance to go visit the Southern California Research Lodge during their festive board, you will greatly enjoy it. There's no doubt. Daniel, tell everybody hello for us, will you please? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, brother. That goes both directions. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's great to see you all. All right. A few quick slides and then we'll call it an evening, gentlemen. Um, real quick, want to let you all know that we have decided uh, that there will be no meeting in December. So we're going to take a break because, you know, we just don't get paid enough. Um, so we're going to have to ask somebody for a raise. But there will be no meeting in December. So our next meeting will be Monday, January 22nd. Okay. So please mark your calendar. We have a couple presenters uh, that will be announced when they are finalized on our end. So stay tuned for that. And everybody who has to avail themselves of it, um, your your uh, transactions that you recently published, I was very happy to receive, and it's got a lot of really good stuff in it. Anybody that hasn't gotten it, ought to. Well, that's a great slide to jump to because you can buy it on Amazon or you can go to rubiconmasoniccsociety.com slash transactions. Uh, tremendous credit, of course, goes to Worship Brother Bizak and Worship Brother Dan Campbell for organizing <laughs> 
and making all of us brothers that are in that transaction look good. So thank you guys very much for that. So RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash transactions. Uh, John, I'm going to kick it back over to you for a moment. Um, would you tell us a little bit about the Philalethes Society, please? Sure. Uh, the Philalethes Society, brothers, was founded in 1928. It's an international Masonic Research Society and the oldest independent Masonic Research Society in North America. It was started to serve the needs of those seeking deeper insight into the history, the rituals, and symbols of our nation, of our fraternity, as well as spreading the Masonic light that comes from them. If you want to learn more about Philalethes, uh, follow the link on the screen. Uh, we'll post that link in a chat room box after this announcement. If you have any other questions, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you, John. Yes, another great avenue for Masonic research, without a doubt. Uh, brothers, we're going to branch out a little bit further, and you will now be able to find the Rubicon Masonic Society via podcast. Uh, we do have, um, we're a little bit behind on the curve, so it's going to take some time to get all of our content uploaded via podcast, uh, but we should be on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple, and all the primary uh, podcast media channels. So if you prefer that, check us out there as well. Give us a comment. And of course, you can always find us on our YouTube channel. For anyone that was at our most recent festive board, here's a good look at everyone that was there in Spindletop Hall. Uh, we will be planning another one. In fact, John, what do you want to go ahead and, and put that out there, or should we wait? Uh, we can go ahead and talk about it. We're going to have uh, another one in September of this year, uh, so it doesn't conflict with some other Masonic events around the country in August, which is our usual time. It will be at uh, Spindletop Hall. And we'll also have a conference like we did this year that'll follow on uh, Saturday. And we'll be making announcements that starting sometime in the first quarter of uh, 2024. And uh, it'll be talked about many times, I'm sure, over the next year uh, here on the Rubicon series. Great. Thank you. And if you were not able to make it, we do have a production coming out. Hopefully, hopefully we will be able to share that with everyone in December in place of our virtual education. So stay tuned for that. We're almost complete with our production of that conference and believe you'll find some enjoyment and some education from that publication. If you haven't already, please take a look at our documentary, themasonictable.com and let us know what you think. Are there any other final comments from anyone before we proceed to close? Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Worship Brother Alan Martin, will you please do the honors? Brother, Grand Architect of the Universe, as we prepare to close our meeting this evening, we give thanks for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. We ask for your continued blessings as we endeavor to live our lives as just and upright men and masons. We pray for the injured, the ill, the recently departed, and we ask that you comfort them during their time of illness or grief. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So mo to be. Uh, brothers, we're going to leave you tonight with a poem by Joseph Fort Newton. So please enjoy. We'll see you next time. Have a great, safe, happy, healthy holiday and new year. We'll see you in January. When is a man a mason? By Joseph Fort Newton. A man is a mason when? When he can look out over the rivers the hills, and the far horizon with a profound sense of his own littleness in the vast scheme of things, and yet have faith, hope, and courage, which is the root of every virtue. When he knows that down in his heart every man is as noble, as vile, as divine, as diabolical, and as lonely as himself, and seeks to know, to forgive, and to love his fellow man. When he knows how to sympathize with men in their sorrows, yea, even in their sins, knowing that each man fights a hard fight against many odds. When he has learned how to make friends and to keep them, and above all, how to keep friends with himself. When he loves flowers, can hunt birds without a gun, and feels the thrill of an old forgotten joy when he hears the laugh of a little child. When he can be happy and high-minded, amid the meaner drudgeries of life. 
when star-crowned trees and the glint of sunlight on flowing waters subdue him like the thought of one much loved and long dead. When no voice of distress reaches his ears in vain and no hand seeks his aid without response. When he finds good in every faith that helps any man to lay hold of divine things and sees majestic meanings in life, whatever the name of that faith may be. When he can look into a wayside puddle and see something beyond mud and into the face of the most forlorn fellow mortal and see something beyond sin. When he knows how to pray, how to love, and how to hope. When he has kept faith with himself, with his fellow man, and with his God, in his hand a sword for evil, in his heart a bit of a song, glad to live, but not afraid to die. Such a man has found the only real secret of masonry, and the one which it is trying to give to all the world. Good night, everyone.